share goes so slow. Always oh, recursive shares. It is on. Can you hear me? It's late. Hello? Hi, can you hear me? Test. It's either that far behind or. Because <laughs> I've heard that too. Is that better? And these things do run. Two seconds is the minimum delay I've seen. Twenty-five seconds is the most I've seen. Wow. That's something we want to fix. Yeah. What about now? I wish. You can hear me. What? Oh, that was like uh, 30 seconds ago. Wow. Is the video that far delayed or just not at the end? Both. At least it's consistent. <laughs> then you're not talking about slide 10 on, which is just yeah. Okay, just barely well, got to where you put on your headset. Well, let me take it off. Okay, is it better now? Can you see me on your... Yeah, okay, so what you're seeing is what he did a minute ago. It's a little confusing when you're in the same room. Right. Yeah. Well, people shouldn't be on the... They don't need to be on the hang off in the room. Yeah. Right. But we want computers here to monitor and make sure that the hang off is working. Would it, would it change if... Um, so, are you, why don't you put your, what you're going to put on your screen so I can see why we're repeating. Oh, let me go back to the screen share. Oh, that right there? Oh, that's just because if you go to screen share and you stay on Google... Hangout, yeah. then. Looks like it's considering it two screens, so we can even move this one over and share a different screen. Well, it's just, it sh I chose um, to share my full screen. So, like, whatever's on my screen, that's what's visible. And so it's doing a recursive thing because inside the. You can come in. We're not actually, we're just testing just stuff. Yeah, if you're. If, yeah, it's equal. Okay. So look, so when I go to the screen share, I can choose. Um, so yeah, just choose your presentation. Here, the thing is, like, I'm going to be switching back and forth between the presentation and the program that the SQL executes in. So share the window and not the. You need a second monitor. Not the program. Just share that window. Share the, so where it says full screen. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's what I did last time. So if I share full screen, then it will do that recursive. Yeah. No, I don't. I could bring another monitor in. We have... I don't know. What? I probably won't revisit my the Hangout screen. Like once the once it starts, I won't come back to it. Except for when I'm yeah yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna do full screen, and then hurry and minimize that. Did I spell company wide correctly? I think that's so dumb. Yeah, why in English do we not capitalize after a hyphen? Like, isn't that. I don't know. Yeah. At least that's what I thought. Yeah. Hmm. I don't think I've ever seen a hyphenated last name. Oh man. That's why they can't be part of the question and answer. They it would be so hard to That's that's dumb. Well, it is one of the limitations that you say. Well, anyone that is just joining, we are on the Google Hangout, we are far behind. Right now it is currently like three minutes till five, but you probably won't get this. So. <laughs> oh no, what is my computer doing? <laughs> oh no, not that, not that, not that. Um, yeah, not quite. I need to close out of these. Welcome. Yeah, they're all open. So are you back up to, well, that's not what I'm sharing right now, though. Hopefully. Jeez. No, I have to be on this for the Hangout. I don't have a microphone in my... Welcome, everyone. I'm James. Thanks. Nice to meet you guys, too. <laughs> Where do you guys all work? What, what? Uh, client services, client executives. Cool. It's exciting. Well, it's nice to have you all. How do you plan on using SQL? Once you learn it, then you'll find out. Then you'll decide. So can you hear like everything or just Okay. How Yeah. Should we like if people comment should I like pass the this thing around? We can talk. 
can do it. Okay, well, is it five? Should we start? Oh, why do I keep saying five? Eleven. Yeah, wow. <laughs> All right, well, welcome everyone to the PSI Company lowercase w wide SQL training. We don't know why the W is lowercase. This is James Draper, and it is June 11th, 2013. So hopefully this will be like a fun training. Like we don't want it to be too boring, right? Because SQL can get pretty boring. I mean, look at me. I'm the epitome of a boring person. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> All right, so um, who am I? Um, I, let me, let me show you this picture. This is my wife. Um, I am the only, I claim to be the only person at PSI that has passed out at my desk. And I passed out because my wife sent me this picture and told me a story that she had fallen off of a ladder at her work. She works at a pediatric office. She was getting a ball for a kid and told me that she fell off a ladder and broke both of her arms and sent me this picture. And so I was like, oh my gosh, like that's awful. Like she's not going to be able to do anything, you know? So I'm like freaking out and I have problems with like seeing blood and getting shots. Like I've passed out seven times, I think. But for some reason, I, even though I didn't see any blood, I didn't, you know, get a shot, I just passed out at my desk. <laughs> and so I come to and like I, I'm looking around and like no one even noticed that I'd passed out. And and so finally, I like I just told my coworkers I was like, "Hey guys, I think I just passed out." And so they all look at me and um, and I'm they're like, "Oh, you look like a ghost. Like you are pale white." So anyway, who am I? I am going. Dang it, we missed it. But it said I am a fainter. That's who I am. All right, well let's jump in. Okay, so SQL history. What does SQL or SQL stand for? Does anyone know? Structured. Yes, structured query language. Very good. There it is, structured query language. When was it created? 1982. <laughs> you guys are all kind of close. Just reverse the 68. Um, well, it became an ANSI standard then. It was actually created in the early 70s by IBM. So how is it pronounced? Because you probably hear people say SQL or SQL. I mean, I don't even know how I pronounce it because it changes. Um, so is it SQL or SQL? Well, I wrote a letter to Don Chamberlain asking him. He's one of the creators of SQL. There's two guys. The other one died. And so he replied back. He said, Hi, James. Since the language was originally named SQL, many people continue to pronounce it. Yeah, so it, originally it was SQL, but because of um, trademark issues, they had to change it to SQL. But he says both are widely used and recognized, which is more official, and he says SQL. So thanks for your interest, Don Chamberlain. He didn't really write that to me. I found that on the Internet. <laughs> Okay, so purpose and goals for today. Um, two things. First, we want to get your computers um, set up and ready to execute SQL queries. A lot of your computers aren't here, um, but we do have a Wikipedia page that shows you how to set it up. But I'll kind of walk you through it. It's really not that complex of a, of a setup. Um, and it is different depending on if you're on a Mac or PC. But... We'll go over all that in a little bit. So that's number one. Number two, we, I want you guys to become familiar with basic SQL syntax. So that is like, you know, select from where, order by limit. Um, just by a quick show of hands, how many are familiar with SQL? Like, who could write a basic query? If you can, raise your hand. Good. That's good. Very good, Tom. Perfect. That's great. So hopefully we'll catch you guys all up with like the basics quickly and then we can, you know, add on to it and get you guys all up to speed and 
learning as much as possible. All right, okay, so let's look at the software. So if you're on a PC, you have two options of the software you can use. Ryan, I'm glad you're in here, I forgot to ask you. Is it okay for everyone to use EMS? Yeah. Okay, so I would recommend using EMS SQL Manager for PostgreSQL. Um, the other option is PG Admin, and that's a free download. You, you know, you can use that for your personal use or whatever. The EMS um, SQL Manager, we actually have a license here. Yeah, so Ryan said, as many people as want to use it can use it. We have a dual site license. Um, and then for a Mac, we there is Navicat. I don't have a Mac, so I can't really walk you through that setup, but everything's easier on a Mac, right? So, supposedly. So, that, that should be straightforward. So, here, really quick, we're going to jump out, and I will show you um, where you can download EMS on our network, and hopefully I won't go into the Google Hangouts page or else we'll see a huge recursive screen thing. Let's go to the desktop. All right, so. Hey, Ryan? Yeah. So the question was asked how do people obtain the license, and you can email IT to get the license key code or whatever. Or they can create a task and find admin for IT, short for help desk, and we'll we can reply with the license. Okay, or create a task and they will reply with the license. So either one. Okay, so to download EMS, you can come out here to the general drive. I think everyone on the network has access to this. And scroll down. My computer's lagging, so I'm really not, I don't know, mentally deficient, hopefully. Come into development. And right here, there is a file called EMS SQL Manager, for, or a folder. And then you can come in here, copy that to your desktop, unzip it, and then just extract the setup file. Um, so not, not too complicated. Um, once you go through all the setup process, I, it's pretty straightforward. I don't think um, you should have any questions, but I'll send a link to the wiki page after. Um, but let me show you what it looks like. So once once you um, you know download it. Oh, the, let me. So real quick, if you guys like have any questions or if I'm not making sense, please feel free to like stop me and you know tell me something. All right. So this is what it looks like. Um, how it works. Well, and it's not going to look like this. The left side where it, this whole left side right here where it says databases and I have all these local hosts and IP addresses, those will all be blank. You won't see anything there. So what you'll do is you'll come here to register a database. You'll hit the plus sign. And we have a, a dev server, so, which is just an IP address. So it's this 192.168.99.210. You'll type that in. The port is going to be 5432. And again, this is all on the, the wiki page. So, And then we use the same username and password. And maybe I won't tell it over the air, but we'll email you guys all what that username and password is. So you just you type that in, and you can uncheck register a single database. Oh, man, I'm going to have to type it in so you guys can see. And then click Next. Then you get a huge list of all of the databases that we have out there. Um, you guys in, in client services and you know maybe other departments, you'll probably be most interested in the PS Admin Juliet Dev Database, um, and then also these Works databases. Let me show you. So PS Works Juliet 10 Dev 11, and ignore the old and the the dev NOI and you know all these all these other ones just just pull the dev um, so you may be wondering what the heck is a database like what is going on right now why do we why is there a server don't worry this this is like a one-time setup and just understanding that there is a server that hosts this all of these databases and each database contains data I, I that's as far as you need to to understand so 
no worries if you're like super confused. So as you 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 know select these, you can pull them over using that arrow. Don't click the double arrow, or else all of your work will be lost because that'll happen. Anyway, so once you add those, then you'll see one entry. You'll see this um, 192.168.99.210 come up, and you will see all the databases that you that you brought over and you know registered basically. So ideally, you'll have admin and then the PS works Julia at one through twelve. Um, so a little bit of background. We who knows how many clients, active clients we have. Yeah, I think there's. I think there's almost. I think there's almost eight hundred. So um, all of those clients are. All of their data is put onto separate databases, and we call that sharding, not with a T, but with a D, right? Because anyway, so so they're all sharded, which means on PS Works Juliet One, you're going to get a list of, or you'll have management a certain group of management companies. On PS Works Juliet Two, you're going to have a, another list. So when you're in, um, I think I can hear. Okay, there it is. Oh, let me just open up a new window. So when you go into client admin and you're choosing, you know, a management company or something to to look at, you'll notice that it will actually tell you like which database they're on. And so if you're going to query that um, data from that client, you'll need to go to the respective database. So let me just show you real quick. Any questions so far while this is loading? We'll get into the SQL syntax in just one second. Yeah. So what's the difference between Postgres and MySQL? Yeah, great question. So um, the question was, what's the difference between Postgres and MySQL? So there are um, a couple main, like, database, um, I guess, database types. Um, one is MySQL, another is Postgres, there's also SQL Server, and so like SQL Server is Microsoft. Um, MySQL, is that Oracle? Oracle what? Oracle MySQL. Yeah, yeah. So Oracle is, is MySQL, and then Postgres is just an open source. Um, yeah, it's just a different, uh, different data, way to store data. I think they follow the same, I mean, there's, there's similarities throughout them all. They all follow the same ANSI standard SQL language, but when you start, like, digging into the different, you know, the different databases, you'll see differences in functions um, and, you know, more, like, in-depth stuff that you probably don't need to worry about right now. Okay. But, yeah, it's just different companies. All right, so let's do a quick search. Um, Let's look and see where Riverstone is. There's the test. Where's the real one right here? So we see their ID, and they're on Works Juliet 3. So that's how you know which, which database each client resides on. All right, so let's jump back in here. Um, so that's a list of databases. And inside each database, there are tables. Um, and you get to the tables by clicking the schemas, public, and then tables. So on the admin database, let me make that a little wider, there are 457 tables. And you can think of a table as like a spreadsheet. Um, there's columns, you know, that list out each, uh, you know, some sort of description about that, that row. So in... Management companies, there's a table out here called management companies. This down here, it lists out all of the fields that are in there. So you'll see there's the man, there's an ID, there's a status, we have the company name. So the, think of these as columns, and then each row will be a separate um, management company. 
Okay, so just we're going to hold this thought right here. Let's jump back to the slide or slides and let's look at SQL syntax. So there are, I want to talk about five um, common phrases in, in SQL that will help us pull data from the database. And yeah, just a sorry, I should probably explain. So, so SQL it stands for Structured Query Language, and it's just a way to pull data from databases. It's really cool because I grew up using Excel, or maybe not in college, you know. In college, I used Excel, and any, like, data manipulation I did or, I mean, it was all manual. Like, if I wanted to, I don't know, change the filters on things or anything else, like, I had to manually go in and change the filter. Well, the cool thing about SQL is you, you write a query, and it does it automatically. You execute that, and it just, you know, spits out exactly what you put. So once once you guys get like more in depth in it, you'll realize that it's just like awesome. It's just the coolest thing. Okay, so the select statement determines which columns you're pulling from the table. So if you recall, we were looking at management companies, and there was a, a column for company name. There's an ID. So in a select statement, you would say select, and then space company ID, comma. Um, ID or company ID, company name, you know, whatever else, any fields or columns that you wanted to pull in that query. Um, oh, quick um, question. Who knows if SQL is um, case sensitive? Does it matter if you write it in all caps or lowercase? No, it's not. Good guess, though. It is not case sensitive. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right, so that's select. That select does columns. The from statement um, designates which table is going to be pulled. So back to that example, if we were going to say select ID comma company name, then we would write, you know, usually we'd do a carriage return and then from space management companies. So we'd, we'd give it the table name. And I'll show you an example here in a second. Um, the where clause affects the rows. And it is a logical statement, meaning you can go in and, and adjust the number of rows that are going to return. For instance, if you wanted in the where clause, I could say where management company ID is greater than 1,000. And then it would pull a list of all management company IDs that had an ID greater than 1,000. Or if the status type was active, I could say where status type is active or equals active. And then it would pull the list of everything that's active. So the where clause as a way to adjust the number of rows that are being pulled. And, and it is a logical statement, meaning you can use and or, you know, greater than or equal to, all, you know, all, all of that logic stuff. Okay, and then there's an order by clause, and that is used to sort it. And you can have a multi you can have uh, multiple variables in the sort if you wanted to sort by like management company and then a list of all the properties or something okay and then there's another function called limit and that will just give it a cap meaning if there's a huge table you're querying against we have some tables on our database that have 42 million rows you probably don't want to pull all of those in one query so you could do a limit and type 100, and then it'll just give you the first 100 rows. So pretty straightforward so far, right? Okay, cool. Okay, before we get into here, so let's jump back and let's write our first query. I know you all are like super excited. You might not have heard it on the Hangout, but there's just cheering and people are going crazy. <laughs> okay, just kidding. No one's saying anything. <laughs> All right, so to write your first query, um, you first want to be connected to a database. So let me show you how that's going to work. We're going to disconnect. So remember, when you first open up EMS or Navicat, whatever you're using, you're going to register. Um, you're going to register these databases, and then in order to run a query against a database, you you connect to it, and you can do that by either right clicking and going to connect to database or you can just double click it. Um, 
so if I double click admin and I connect to it, you can see it turns yellow. I'm not going to be able to now run a query against PS Works Juliet 1. I'm only, I'm going to run a query against admin. That's the one I'm connected to. And to bring up the, the uh, query editor or a place where you actually type the code, you're going to make sure you're, you're clicked on here. And then you can either click the show SQL editor or this one, or you can hit F12. So we'll just click here and it will bring up a blank sheet where you can write SQL or it'll show a couple. Okay, never. Okay, so this it'll show a blank sheet and you'll be on number one, not 14. Okay, so here we go. Let's write our first SQL statement and let's do it on the management companies table. Okay. Let's see. I want to let's see how many um, companies we have. Um, one thing to note too is in the admin database, this lists out all of our companies. It's not just um, you know, we're, it's not sharded basically. So like if we were to run a query in Juliet 1 to pull all management companies, we're not going to get the full list because there's only a limited number in Juliet 1. Is that good, everyone? Does that make sense? Yes. Cool. Okay, my computer's slightly frozen. There it goes. All right, so in the select statement, this is where we designate our columns, if you can remember. Um, a cool thing too is if you wanted to pull all columns from a table, you do a star, a shift date, or asterisk, and that will automatically pull every column. So a lot of times you'll hear people say, oh, just you know, do a select star from this, and that's like the most basic query you can do, select star from, and then we'll type the name of the table, which is management companies. So this is like, you know, probably the most simplified query you can run, and this is pulling from the management companies table every field and every row, every column and every row. So to actually execute it, you can hit F9, which is what I just did, or you can hit this play, this green play button or whatever. How do you know the names of the tables? Very good question. Yes, yeah, so they all the tables are on the left hand side over here. So go into schemas, public tables, and then you'll see this this list. So Tom, um, you bring up a good point though. That That is one of the more difficult things when you're first starting to try to build queries that actually work. Like how do you know which tables to use? Um, let, I will get back to, I will get back on that question because that, that's a very good point. Okay. So for right now we know that management companies exists so um, let, oh yeah, let's look at the data. So let me pull this up a little bit. So we did a select star for management companies. Here we see every um, every column, so ID, entity ID, company status type, all these, and then we also get every row. And if we bring this up, it tells us there are 2,663 rows in the management companies table. Does that mean we have 2,600 active companies? Yeah, probably not, because you see that there is a company status type ID right here. So let's limit it. Um, let's let's only look at active companies. So how what what SQL syntax word would I use to limit the number of rows? Yes, where that was a trick question. Limit also will will um, limit the number of rows too. So and let's that's a good point. That that really was an educated answer. So let's do let's just look at limit 100, and you can see it will randomly pull 100 management companies. So that's how limit works. Okay, so now let's look at where. Where so what do we type here? How do we know if the company is active or not? This is where it might get a little tricky, um, but I think you guys can handle it. So the company status type ID references um, a table called company status types. And if you look at some of the values here, just right along here, you'll see nines, a three, a four, three, like what in the heck? Like we're, we're humans, we don't 
talk in numbers. I don't know. Like, why don't we just put active or something? Well, it's because storing numbers is a lot easier and not as it doesn't take up as much space as storing letters. So let's just look. Um, there is a table called company status, status types, and let's see what is in that table. Okay, so this table is, is showing us that, okay, a three means prospect, a four means client, five is terminated, nine is a test, 11 is sales, and 12 is canceled. So, so over here we can say, um, company, company status type ID is equal to four because we want to know all of the like active clients, right? So let's run this and see what we get. So we have 860 rows that returned and you can see that this company status type ID, they are all fours all the way down. So some of you might be familiar with some of the company names here. Dear Elder, that's a good one. So, so what I just showed you was a, a foreign key relationship. Now that, when I first was learning SQL and I heard like foreign or primary key, I just was like, I wanted to vomit. Like, what in the heck are you talking about? Like, that does not make sense. But it's really not that complicated. It's, it's um, pretty straightforward. So in a... And this kind of hits the point of a relational database. So in a database, the, the whole point of it is to only, dang it, I wasn't going to go into this. Why am I doing it? Is this, maybe this is too complex. I was really going to teach this next class, but I can't control my mouth. So let's just do it. Okay, so a relational database, the whole purpose of it is to, um, is to not have data duplicated. So think about it. Uh, ah, dang it. I'm, I'm really starting to regret going into this now because we need to learn about joints first. I knew I should have stuck with my gut. Okay. Let's, what? Never I know, it never happened. Um, okay, yeah. Let's, okay, we'll, we'll stick with this. So, Company status type is equal to four. What if we wanted to look at, like, um, so over here you see that there is a an updated on. What if we wanted to look at companies that were updated, or maybe let's look at created on, because that's like when, when the company first came into existence. Let's look at to see how many companies were created after 2012. So help me out. What would I what would I write here? Well, and maybe let's keep it active companies too. So, yep. So so if you want to add another um, where logic, you you can either say and or or. So we're gonna say we want it to be active, and we also want the what field? Yep, created on to be, and then what, what do I use here? Okay, greater than, okay, and then to, to do a date, you, you surround the date in single quotes, and so, and then we just, you can just type it in. So, greater than 2012, one, one, but we'll actually want to do greater than or equal to. I could have done 2011, 12, 31. That would have worked. Okay, so let's run this and see, so right now we're at 860, let's see how many we, we get after this. So 244 were created after 2012 or during 2012. Pretty cool, huh? So like we are pulling data from the database. Like that's how easy it is. Just in a short, you know, 30 minutes, we can, you know, you guys already know the basics. Like you can pull from a table. The yeah. Place, like, to know the single quotes yeah, good question. So the, the question is, on the wiki page, is there a way to tell, or is there a place to tell us, like, that we need to put quotes around a date, or, you know, maybe the type of operator to use or something? And not that I'm familiar with, I don't think we have, like, a wiki page to do it. Um, 
what you can do though is use um, online references. So SQL Zoo is really good. W3 Schools is also a good one to, you know, just as like a refresher. And maybe um, I might be able to even just put together like a little SQL cheat sheet that kind of like covers all of the little tiny things that are hard to memorize. So, yeah, great question. Any other questions? Any questions about the select, the from, or the where? No? Okay, let's look at order by. So we have a pretty cool query right now. We're, we're looking at all active, you know, current companies that have a created on date past 2012, one, one. So the order by, who remembers what the order by does? Sorts. Yes, it sorts. So what would we type to have it sort by, let's say, company name? Like what if we wanted to see an alphabetical list? What would we type right here? Yeah. Uh, um, company name. So let's see what this does. So yeah, there we go. Yeah. Yes, good good question. So to do ascending, which is default, it's ASC. To do descending, it's DS, D E S C. And so let's just test it and make sure it works. Yep, sure enough, there's York at the top. And then let's say we wanted to know um What if we wanted to see who it was? Um, well, uh, you can do multiple elements on here. It only works, like if we had um, multiple companies on here, like let's say that we had another column with properties and it was listing out all the properties. Anyway, we can do a, a multiple order by where it would first order by the company and then by another element and then another element. And you do that just by separating them by com with commas. So we could we could do um, by oh that's what we can do. Let's do year. So so if we or let's do it by date. So created on. So if any company has the same date that they're created on, then we want to see them um, categorized af alphabetically after. So Home Spring Realty Partners were the first. Okay, so oh sorry, that's updated. So yeah. Um there are, because the created on is a timestamp, I don't think we're gonna have any duplicates or any like any of the same time on here. Um so let's do a quick function. Um in in SQL you have the ability to to basically do anything like like I can pull the year out of the created on date um, and you do that by saying extract and then year from created on and so now if we if we order by that then we'll see all of the companies that were created in 2012, we're going to um, order them descending. So then let's look. Once we get to 2013, we should see it start over. Okay, so there's, where is it? There we go. So there it is. So we end at four elements in 2012, and then in 2013, we begin at Woodside Management Group. Cool, huh? Does that give, that was probably a dumb example to, prove my point, but does that make sense? <laughs> so what is the extract? In a timestamp, I guess it knows the year is the year, but how do you, are there yeah. limitations on what can be extracted? Um, yes, so, and anytime you're using like a, a function, um, like extract, or we even have like a date trunk function that will, um, you can say date 
date trunk uh, month, and then it will pull both the year and the month, and and just give it like a an 01 as a date, um, which is like really beneficial for grouping, which we'll get into probably in a couple classes. Um, but yeah, anytime you're looking at functions, it's yeah, Come, go to like um, Postgres. So PostgresQL.org, and it, it has, I mean, it, it's a huge library of all the different functions you can use in different, um, you know, ways ways to use them. So we can come in here and look at extract. Let's see if we can find it. So I'm just going to search for extract now, and we can see extract tells us that it's pulled from a timestamp. So it gives us an example. So you can do um, anything from year down to you know hour or minute, and maybe even millisecond. That yes, yep, great question. So these are all functions, you know, and there's tons of them that you can use in uh, in, in SQL. Okay, so right now we have like a lot of different columns in here. What if we only wanted to look at a couple a couple columns, like let's say ID and company name? How would we change the select statement to do that? So would I keep the star in here? No. Okay, good. I wouldn't keep the star, and then how would I how would I get it to only show? Okay, company name, right? ID? ID company. ID or just ID? Oh yeah, so yeah, so the field name is ID. Okay. Whatever the field name is. Yep. Yeah, exactly right. And there we go. So there's the company name and all the ID. And notice that it's still ordering the way that we want it to, even though it's not showing those fields over here. Do these tables pull on revenue as well? Um, the management company table? Yeah. Uh, well, let's look. Yeah, we could do query on revenue if that's what you guys want to look at. Um, so if you look at the management company's table, you don't, there isn't a revenue field in here. Um, so let's look at... I, that we share our revenue publicly, right? Or at least within the company. Like that's okay to look at. I don't know. I was just wondering. No. Okay. Yeah, well. Yeah. So maybe maybe we'll have another one where we can go into like if you have. Just for us personally. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But that was a really good question, and that's like an interesting thing to look at. Okay, cool. So, any other questions about what we've covered before we move on? Okay, the question was what are the most common purposes of queries? Um, so I'm going to answer your question and Tom's question at the same time. So, and Tom's question previously was, how do we know, um, what in the heck? How do we know uh, which tables to use? So, okay. So first off, queries are used very uh, commonly in PHP. So when you look at like when you're loading up client admin. You, you don't realize it, but there are like hundreds of queries loading and, you know, hitting the database, pulling data, and then PHP takes that data and shows it to you on the page. So, you know, every time you're click you're going, you know, clicking on really any website, you know, queries are being sent to, 
to different databases and the data is being pulled over. Um, and so we have a cool function in our system in, in client admin and also in resident works. We have the ability to add a cookie which tells um, our servers to show us the queries that are being executed on the page. So, so you can see right here um, down at the bottom, I already have set up the, the cookie here in Firefox, um, but it tells me, okay, this, this query right here executed to show some of this data. So is that kind of, that's cool, right? Isn't that cool? So let's look at this query. Um, let's pull it over and let's make sure. Yeah, from NPS scores. So we can we can. I just copied that and I'm going to paste it right here. A quick little trick in EMS is if you hit Control Shift F, it automatically formats the query. Come on, come back to life. So kind of cool, you know, it, it formats it so it's not just one long line. Um, so here, let's look at this query that's executing. And I think you guys would be able to understand, like, everything that it's doing. So does someone want to, like, walk, walk me through um, what this query is doing? Who's brave? That's okay if you're wrong. When you turn in what columns we're bringing in, right? So yep. Yep. Yeah, exactly right. Okay, and then what's this? Uh, what is this right here? It's the table it's yep. Okay, so yeah, so far spot on. That's the table it's pulling from. Those are all the fields. Okay, what about the uh, the where? This one might be a little more tricky. But so, what is this null? What does null mean? Yeah, empty or um, what about what is a blank null? Like if it's just a space or no space, is that null? No, it's not. So null is different than just than a blank. Yeah, and we'll go more into detail into nulls. I think in the next training when we talk about joins, joining multiple tables together. So yeah, so a null means that it it's not blank because sometimes anyway yeah it, it just means it's not blank. Um, what about the next two lines? Who wants to try to explain those? And Tom, can you see from back there? I can't see it very well. Okay, so I'll just read it out loud real quick. So it says score date time, so the date that the score was submitted, is greater than or equal to now minus the interval three months. Or the, score, the send date time is greater than or equal to now minus the interval three months. So what's now minus interval three months? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Pretty cool, huh? So let's run it and see what we get. So we get 1,500 rows, and it just shows, you know, management company IDs, the MPS type, and then what the score is with, with the date, both date time, score and send date time. Cool, huh? Okay, so let's go back. I want to show you some more um, uh, queries, I guess, that, that you can look at. So if we log in to client admin, and I don't know why it tells me my access is denied all the time. So here we can see a lot of queries. These ones probably are a little more complex than what we're ready for quite yet. But I mean, you can see, so just opening your dashboard, look at all these queries that run. So, so Tom, to get back to your question, if, um, and let me um, open this while I answer. So if, if you're looking for like specific tables or to, or to find out which tables you should use, a good way to go about it is to, um, to come into client admin, pull the, you know, go to the page that has the data that you're looking for, and input the cookie, the, this cookie display debug info, and it will, you know, show you all the queries that are generating, and then you can kind of go through and choose which one is probably the most applicable. It, it might be a little bit of a, a slightly daunting task initially, 
but the more you become familiar with our system, the more you know it'll just be a smooth process. You know that this data is here on this page. I'm going to display the queries. You know, you pull the query, format it, and you know you know all the tables that that are being used. How do you set the query to display the SQL? Great question. Okay, so it's a two-step process. First, you have to download Firebug. And after you download it, it shows right here. Let me show you um, how to download Firebug. It's pretty straightforward. Is that for all browsers? No, it's only for Firefox. Uh, well, Firebug, I think it is for Chrome, but adding the cookie, Chrome has issues with it. If you guys can figure it out, though, let me know, because I would love for it to be in Chrome. <laughs> But yeah, so far I've only been able to work consistently in Firefox. So you can just Google Firebug. Let's wait for it to load. And it, it's a simple download. You just click it. And if this didn't take so long, we'd already be done explaining it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great idea. Tom. Workstation support guy sitting here is you know, imagine what I'm thinking when you're telling everyone to go out on the internet and download something called Firebug. Oh yeah. 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 So yep, so that's Firebug. If after you install it then you're gonna What's the URL for that? The the URL is get yeah, getfirebug.com. So maybe before you guys download this, we'll I'll get with Tom and we can maybe put together something that'll streamline it for everyone. Or yeah. Okay, cool. So that that's how you get Firebug. Well, that's not how you guys. Uh, everyone will get it, but that is one way too on your personal machine, maybe. Okay, the Fire Cookie. Same thing. You just type into Fire key shows up, so we'll we'll skip the loading process. Um, so once you have both of those installed, um, Firebug. Okay, here we go. So f when you enable Firebug, you get this pop-up thing in the bottom. So there are a lot of beneficial things down here. The only thing you need to worry about is this cookies tab. So it's thinking. My computer runs slow under pressure. Okay, it's still thinking. Okay, so you come in here to cookies. You're going to go create cookie. Well, actually, we're going to cancel because first you need to be in the domain that you want the, the queries to display. This only works on our system. Don't try it on Yahoo or Google. It's not going to do anything. Um, so once once you're on our domain, which which is this client admin at propertysolutions.com, then you can come in here and add the cookie. So you click the cookies tab, go under cookies, create cookie. And then it brings up this little dialog box and the name has to be in all caps and it is called display underscore debug underscore info. And so this is the benefit of having the, of being on the host because then it just auto populates it. You leave the path name expires. Um, if you guys are familiar with cookies, they are they have to have an expiration date, and so you just tell it to expire, probably around the time when I will die in 2062. And then the value you change to one, and that's it. So once you click OK, you relage. I'm now got two cookies up there. I probably shouldn't have clicked OK. Anyway, but you know you can then reload the page and you'll see all the queries that are generating for that page. Is it good to only have one cookie page? I don't know. It probably, maybe it doesn't matter. I don't know if it's bad to have two cookies. <laughs> we'll see. If it double, if it gives me two queries, then we'll know not to do it. Let's see. 
one thing with with this display debug info cookie is it makes your page like crazy wide like look at this one actually isn't too bad but I mean it like spans way out over here now so that's why I like to have one browser that does the displaying of queries and then my Chrome is what I'll do to just you know have it more aesthetically pleasing so anyway does that answer your question are we good okay sorry is this like really boring because I'm okay good Alrighty, um, let's see what else. Okay, so SQL help websites. Um, SQL Zoo is actually really cool. I just um, found it this morning. And you can go on, and they have like, um, let's just go on to it. They have like really cool quick take. No. And if my pages would load faster, I wouldn't have to have the awkward pauses. Okay, so here's SQL Zoo. Um, so on the left side, you'll see like a bunch of beneficial or just different, you know, SQL commands that you can run. I wouldn't worry too much about like the inserting, the creating the tables or updating stuff. I think you guys will mainly want to just focus on like writing select queries, which is just pulling data. We're not going to be updating or, or adding data yet. Um, so anyway, you can come over here and just like learn different functions, how SQL works. Um, and then you can also change, yeah, be sure to change your engine to PostgreSQL. Although it should all function pretty similarly unless you get more in depth with the functions. So if we come in here to, to select basics, um, what it does is it shows you like a table on the right hand side. And then number one, it will say, oh, whoops, I was just seeing if I could mess them up. Um, let's look at number two. So it, it just, it'll give you kind of like a hint of a query. Um, you can execute it and see what the result is and it'll tell you if you're right or wrong. Gives you little instructions here. So SQL Zoo is really cool. Um, W3 schools, not quite as, uh, you know, yeah, I, interactive, thank you. That was exactly what I was looking for. But it's still nice to answer any questions. Um, okay, so for I, that pretty much does it for this week. Um, let me, let's look at our syllabus. Okay, so today we, kind of, we went over the select from where order by limit. Um, next week, I want to go more into detail on the description of the relational data model. And I think we will first need to understand how joins work. That's one of the most important aspects of the of SQL. Um, so understanding how joins work and then, you know, maybe cover some other functionality type stuff. Um, we did look at, uh -oh. we did look at display debug info. Um, so yeah, so next week, or I guess it, it'll be in two weeks, next week will be PHP, and then in two weeks we'll go over joins and more of the relational data model. So thank everyone for coming or listening. And I'll see you later. End.